on me request you while the session is going on we request you to keep your microphones on mute to avoid any distractions or disruptions however the floor will be open for questions and answers after the session so you may engage through your microphones and even switch on the cameras according to your preference should you have any other queries, please feel free to send us a direct message through the chat box on Zoom. I will now briefly touch upon how the webinar will proceed. We will begin with the opening remarks by Mr. Mohammed Aslam, Minister of National Planning and Infrastructure, Republic of Maldives. After that, begins the session on strategic foresight. Today's session will be moderated by Mr. Enrico Gabiglia. UNDP resident representative in the Maldives. Our speakers for the day are Ms. Arthi Krishnan, Strategic Advisor on Foresight of UNDP Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific, and Mr. Lee Tveramaito, Director of Department of Local Authorities, Ministry of Internal Affairs from the Republic of Vanuatu. After the speaker's presentations, we will have a dialogue with the moderator and speakers, which will then be followed by the Q&A session. So without further ado, I'd like to request Mr. Mohamed Aslam, Minister of National Planning and Infrastructure, Republic of Maldives, to present his opening remarks. Minister Mohamed Aslam. Good morning, uh, uh, resident trips. Of UNDP Maldives and Rico, uh, dear participants, uh, I'm very glad that um, you've invited me to uh, make an opening remarks for this uh, um, important uh, session where we talk about you know, how the future uh, of coming out of an uncertain time. Um, I don't need to explain to anybody that uh, the difficult time that we have been going through over the last uh, two years, um, and we've learned a number of lessons in, in that uh, two years. Um, this particular session happening uh, online is something that would have never happened uh, before the pandemic, uh, and we would have to spend a lot of money, but a lot of uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, to come together physically uh, in one place and you know hold these sort of meetings. But things have changed, and I I see this as, as something very positive. We can be where we are, and then we can um, talk to each other. Have meetings like this, this, and um, you know, we can run our affairs uh, in, on, in in the digital world. Uh, I was not born and bred uh, in in the digital world. Uh, slowly learning uh, to be, uh, you know, to live my life with with this new new lifestyle and ways of doing things. Um, I can't say it, 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 it can be completely as an old, you know, uh, an alternative to uh, physical interaction. But this is good enough for us to continue with, with what we do. Uh, we've um, managed to run the governments. Uh, we've managed to run businesses uh, online, um, and then uh, we. You come to learn how important that uh, the digital media is going to be in our life in times to come, and, and it's it's not a bad thing. It's it's, it's not at all a bad thing. Um, Maldives have done extremely well uh, in the pandemic. Uh, we were among the very few countries to open our borders. Uh, Six months into the pandemic, uh, our economy is bouncing back fairly well. Um, of course, whatever happens in the world talks that uh, globally does have an impact on us. So uh, we, we feel uh, what uh, happening in in, you know, in Europe now uh, that that is is having an impact on us. But 
but I'm sure we will uh, we will live through this uh, fairly well. We've uh, we've had a we have a vision for this country. Uh, uh, this is an island nation with a dispersed population and one central uh, the island where you know, most services are provided from. The government has a vision where we want to truly decentralize uh, the way we do this in uh, So we've come up with a, a special development plan for for the country, um, um, which divides the nation into three regions, six zones, and 26 clusters of islands. And we want to integrate these islands with a transport network, uh, which is a public uh, ferry system. We are well uh, underway with, with that program, and then we hope to have uh, this service uh, started uh, for at least six of the tolls uh, in the country. Uh, and I believe that uh, without transportation, we cannot truly uh, integrate ourselves. Uh, and uh, with this new medium, we have found the, the, the digital medium, we have found to interact with. And, and do our best. Uh, this, this has to be this has to be refined. We could do a lot more. Um, we could easily go back to old ways of doing things, but I hope we we don't go uh, to the same level uh, of that physical presence and physical uh, uh, interaction with each other uh, to that extent. Uh, well, before the pandemic, uh, we uh, I hope that we would still use to um, continue to use this sort of medium uh, uh, to to run the governments and, and, and do business. Uh, and and I'm, I'm glad that this you know this is happening uh, online. Uh, such things can be can should not be stopped. It's going to cost uh, save us a lot of costs. So it's going to um, do a lot of good for the environment, uh, and and um, Um, please hold on. I think we may mixed and I have lost his connection. Please hold on for a few minutes. Um, we are just checking with the minister, um, so please hold on a minutes.
Uh, I believe you have some connection issues over at the minister's office. So um, we will continue with the session. Uh, I will now hand over to Mr. Enrico Gavitia, UNDP resident representative in the Maldives, to proceed with the session. Our session will focus on strategic foresight. Over to you, Mr. Enrico. Thank you. A very good morning to uh, everybody, and uh, I'm sure uh, as soon as the Minister Bach will, uh, will acknowledge his presence in the meeting, I first of all definitely would like to thank uh, His Excellency the Minister of Planning, Housing, and Infrastructure, Mohamed Slam, for the enriching words of opening on, on this series. Uh, UNDP is very proud of partnering with both Minister and the President Office. I, I had exchange with uh, Hamid Hassan, DD Secretary of Cabinet Affairs, in designing in a series of high level dialogues and certainly humbled uh, to be able to add value with our network of expertise within the framework of the executive announcement and enrichment program 2021 2023. And uh, congratulations to all uh, partners and uh, uh, colleagues who are joining us online. I see a numerous uh, number, so I'm very, I'm very humbled by this. This series is meant uh, to open up a space for Maldives leaders and emerging executives to be versatile and at ease with a selected set of global trends in public administration, development policy, and innovation. So, and today is an exciting topic because we're talking about future. And uh, as the minister was mentioning, you know, we can all agree that the scale and the speed of change unfolding in the world today is at a pace which is faster than the scale and scope and speed of change unfolding within our space of influence. So we can also agree that in a classic bi-dimensional space and time area of human operations, we're constantly dealing with a lack of time for reflections of events we just passed. And we were tested at times, if not stressed, in handling the augmenting workload of the present. And uh, our present is filled with a long series of concurrent events, which are happening at the same time in, in a multiverse of situation and all becomes volatile, uncertain, complex, and very ambiguous. There is a acronym, of course, we've been coined for this, which is called a book award. So why we can skip for today, the making sense of the past tense, why we would leave maybe the managing practice of how to deal with the presence uh, and current to different dialogues. Today, we will concentrate to hear about new approaches, tools, methodology, and transformational shift that must occur if we are to continue to meet the challenge and opportunities of the 21st centuries head on. Being strategic is always tough. Be strategic into the future, like for side, is a bit of a nice challenge. So to understand better then, and that the capacity to anticipate and adapt to change is an indispensable capabilities of an effective public service, to appreciate that the even public institution need to elevate the game of planning, develop and implement resilient policies able to grow possible futures. We have brought today, Two speakers, wonderful speakers, which I'm pleased to introduce you. Our first speakers, Arati Christian, Strategic Advisor and Foresight from the UN, United Nations Development Program, Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific. Arati is specialized in strategic and applied foresight for the humanitarian and development sector. A seasoned expert globally, she works on the intersection of humanitarian and development futures strategic foresight and anticipatory institutional transformation. She's currently the strategic advi foresight advisor for UNDP, uh, where she's designing the integration of system approaches to foresight across the Asia Pacific Bureau to build anticipatory capacities, decision-making and programming offers to see, manage and respond to a short and long-term risk signals policy and investments. The second speakers, we have Leith, Mr. Leith Dermaito, with over 18 years of working experience, working with Vanuatu 
government in critical areas of policy, legislation, planning, budget, and reporting frameworks. Leith was formerly the director of local authority in Vanuatu from 2019-2022. In addition, as a senior a DFAT official of the Australian High Commission in the aid sector, Leith gained extensive experience working with the Prime Minister Office uh, and Planning Agency and Development Partners in Vanuatu, regionally and internationally, underpinning delivery of initiatives through inclusion and cultural community engagement by working closely with chiefs, community leaders, faith-based organizations, civil society, international non-governmental organization, private sector, he has specialized in infrastructure, energy governance, and recently planning in national, urban, and regional levels. In a way, a colleague of yours. Um, so to start up on, on this session, let's go to, uh, uh, I can turn to Arati. Um, that would be great to, to have online with the, with the presentation. And uh, please Arati, you have the, you have the floor and you can probably share the presentation. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you uh, so much Enrico. And good morning, esteemed colleagues, uh, ministers, um, and, and, and colleagues in the Maldives and MDP. It is my pleasure uh, and Arati, privilege. Arati, apologies. I think we have the minister back. Um, so it will, uh, as soon as, thanks for letting me know colleagues that he's been back so it would have got one of this chat message. Uh, Minister, can can you can you hear us? Yes, I can. Uh, Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, That's to be in that. I don't want to say much, but uh, you know, there there was the you know the glitches in the you know the new way of doing oh. things. So that's that's these are the sort of things that requires you know refinement, improvement. If we can do that, this would be a perfect perfect platform. I I think I'll I'll now just listen. Wonderful minister, and, and thanks a lot for joining us. I mean, your presence is gracing the event. And then, um, of course, I, I'm much obliged uh, about your, uh, your your interaction with us today. So um, we were at the point of Arati presenting. So please, Arati, if you wouldn't mind starting your, your piece, and I'm sure we can move on on the uh, intervention. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, Thank you so much. It's uh, um, if, if we could take a group photo of the speakers while the minister is also here. I think that would be great before we proceed with the session. So um, my family requests all speakers um, to switch on their videos to take a group photo. Mr. Lee, if we can have you switch on your video as well. I see we're all online and smiling. Shall we snap the pictures? Yes, I think we've got the picture, so we can proceed with the session. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, Arati, back to you. Thank you so much, Enrico, and um, esteemed colleagues uh, and Minister Aslam. Uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to be here with you uh, this morning to talk about uh, strategic foresight and what it means to design anticipatory systems and anticipatory governance. Uh, my name is Arati Krishnan. I work for UNDP uh, with Enrico and my other UNDP colleagues. Um, and my work looks at how do we be better prepared for what might be emerging in front of us, whether those are new types of risks that are emerging or new types of opportunities. How do we ensure that we are best prepared uh, to, to meet these new changes and, and not, not continue to be taken by surprise? Um, so the first thing, I, there's an image here that I want to put up, which is, as you can see, a picture of black swans. Now, in the world of futures, or 
or foresight. The term black swan often means something that is completely unexpected that has taken us by surprise. Um, the minister talked about COVID and the impacts it has had on us uh, over the last two years. Um, and this is very true. And when COVID was first hitting all of us back in uh, March 2020, uh, exactly two years ago, we should say, um, a lot of people started calling it a black swan event, something that was completely unexpected, that took the world by surprise. There was no way we could be prepared for this. But this is actually untrue. A uh, global pandemic to the scale of what COVID was had long been predicted. It had been in trends reports, global health trends reports, global health forecast reports for almost a decade prior to COVID actually hitting us. The challenge and the issue wasn't that it wasn't uh, predicted or forecasted. It was that we didn't pay enough attention to it. We didn't pay enough attention to a risk that seemed so far off, that seemed so implausible to occur, that we weren't prepared for it. Most governments all over the world, whether regardless of where um, uh, you know where in the world you were, were completely taken by surprise and were left scrambling. So the issue isn't so much whether something is predicted or forecasted or anything like that. The issue really becomes how often do we pay attention to risks and opportunities that are starting to emerge, but that we don't necessarily think may happen. So very often, um, whether we're in, sitting in a government or we're sitting in large institutions, the challenge, as Enrico talked about in his opening comments, is responding to very fast and complex change. Um, the OECD did a, re re did a research report about, um, I think it was about a, two years, a year ago, where it looked at what were the main barriers that prevented governments and institutions from responding quickly. And there were four that were identified. One, that the structures and the models that have allowed governments to operate at very large nation scale are not adapted to respond to a global context in which problems are framed. Example, the climate crisis, which is a global issue, not just a national issue. The second, that traditional planning and policy making is, you know, uh, hypothetically futures oriented in nature. But the upfront analysis we often do is based on past information with very little room for experimentation. So if we think about all the types of uh, trends reports that I'm sure many of us have written, a normal trends report is usually based on things that have happened from the past till today. And very little of it looks as to what may be emerging into the future. The third is that it can sometimes be difficult to invest resources proactively to manage something before it is widely understood. If we don't yet fully understand the full implications of a problem or an issue, it can be really, really hard to say we want to invest large amounts of money into that. And the last one, which I would say is not just with governments, but it is a global issue, is that our reliance on specialization has made um, has, has, has resulted in us working in silos. So we still look at risks, we still look at issues through siloed lenses, whether that's climate change, whether that's um, you know, digitalization, whether that's through debt, the debt crises. We don't see how risks and these issues interconnect and therefore the resulting complexity. So therefore, why, why must we be anticipatory? Why is this important? The types of challenges that we are facing today and are going to continue to face, as, as uh, Enrico also mentioned, a very VUCA world, it points to futures that are increasingly uncertain, meaning that we don't yet know how it's going to play out. So how do we make decisions today considering its impact on a future that doesn't yet exist. So to grapple with that uncertainty requires us taking both a long-term perspective 
and being anticipatory in the face of emerging realities. And this goes beyond just relying on one tool or one method, but really what we want to do is go past and push past our traditional approaches of short-term programming and challenge our assumptions and mental models. So we're essentially what we're saying is to be anticipatory in this way is to hedge our bets on the future that we cannot rely on this idea that what has happened to date will unfold in exactly the same way into the future in a static way, but we want a much more adaptive, holistic approach. And we do this for three reasons. We want to ensure that we want to ensure relevance in our policies, that it is fit for purpose, not just for today, but also for tomorrow. We want to be able to navigate uncertainty, and we want to be able to manage future risks, just to prevent as much as possible being taken by surprise. So what is therefore anticipatory governance, and, and what is its link to strategic foresight? Strategic foresight is the bedrock of anticipatory governance, and anticipatory governance is the mode of decision making that we call for in the face of extreme uncertainty. What we mean by that is to meaningfully apply insights about future risks and opportunities into how we make decisions today, whether that is for our structures, our policies, how we operate uh, internally and externally, that is fundamentally the work of anticipatory governance. There isn't just one model of anticipatory governance. There, it, it is essentially the ways in which we choose to make decisions about managing future risk. But a, a, a fundamental model that we're also looking uh, to apply here at UNDP is ensuring that we have a foresight system in place, meaning the ability to generate knowledge about the future that we can then integrate that intelligence into our policies and the way we implement it today. A feedback system to continually assess whether the pathways we are choosing, whether we're investing in is the correct one or needs, uh, needs adaptation. And of course, this all must be accompanied by an overall shift in culture and structures. So what is foresight? Foresight, as I mentioned, is the bedrock of being anticipatory. It is the bedrock of, of anticipatory governance. It is not to predict the future, and this is where it is different from forecasting and predictions, but rather it is to anticipate what could happen and to ensure that regardless of what happens, what scenarios we imagine, that our strategies and policies are robust across those scenarios. And it pushes us to think beyond just in linear ways, but to think long-term and systematically about things that might disrupt our, our pathways. It ultimately grants rigor and structure to work with things that are unknown to us. So for example, you know, yes, digitalization is an extremely big driver in our world today, but we are still grappling with those implications and impacts. So how can we be better, how can we better understand future impacts of things like digitalization on our social equity policies, on our social contracts? Um, if we are not playing with different types of scenarios that help pull that out. It doesn't promise silver bullet solutions, nor does it replace other forms of policy and planning, but rather it is aimed to cultivate entry points so that we can understand forces that can impact our strategy or policy direction. It can identify gaps or areas that require us to more deeply analyze and to explore new approaches so that we can be better prepared for future risk or to harness future good. So we want to embed foresight to improve the way we make decisions, to be more anticipatory in our decision making so that we can see, manage and respond to short and long-term risk signals. And by doing so, we are able to then navigate uncertainty we are able to use that data to inform our current and future decision making, 
And we're able to clarify our position and our relevance in the event of something escalating or decreasing. It is multidimensional. It encompasses understanding you doing a strong futures analysis. It encompasses working with strategy and planning systems. It encompasses innovation and it encompasses taking a systems approach. And you can see that I've got two boxes there, one external and one internal. Now, external is often where we focus a lot of our attention to, that we might use ideas about the future or our analysis about future risks or future opportunities to redesign our policies and services for citizens. But it must also be accompanied by internal systems change, because if we cannot change the ways in which we are doing our interior planning, our interior budget management, our interior risk management to go along with that exterior change, then something that there's a there's a there's a there's a tension in that. Um, I wanted to just put up here because often when I when we do a lot of this work with um, economists and and national planners um, and do the same with institutions and with governments, um, we have to talk about well what's the difference between forecasting and planning versus foresight in support of decision making. So a traditional approach to how we have always done it is we work in the existing system. And what we're looking for is incremental improvement. And really the time horizon is short, one to three years. We assume a relatively static, stable, predictable environment. And we think in very sort of causal loops. So if we do this, then this will happen. It's sort of that traditional log frame approach. Um, and we follow through on plans as if they're blueprint. Whereas if we want to be able to navigate things that are uncertain, things that we really don't know how it's going to plan out, then we must look at transformational change. We must look at medium term, five to 10 years into the future. We have to think that, that um, it's not causal. In fact, change happens as an emergent process. Um, and we have to not just assume that plans will unfold as a blueprint, but rather that plans need to be flexible, adaptable, and exploratory. Now, this sounds a lot easier on paper than it is to actually implement it. So I want to ensure that you know, we recognize how hard this is to actually do. But ultimately, if we want to be able to work through uncertainty and in the ambition to leapfrog to be future fit, these are the types of approaches we should be able to, to work towards. And we do this because as I mentioned earlier, the risks that are emerging are converging. They're not happening in silos. We're seeing climate risks greatly intersecting with technology risks, greatly inter intersecting with conflict risks. And so therefore we have to build uncertainty into the very layers of how we do our policy and planning design. Our normal approach of assuming that if we have a risk model and we can generate a forecast, that means it's causal and linear, but that does not account for uncertainty and complexity. Um, the last few things I just wanna put up here is to show what does static policy mean when we look at it through a lens of uncertainty. So at a level one, um, you know, we can say that we can see the future, we have an optimal policy, we want to forecast it, and we want to choose the type of policy for that future. Um, it's still fairly static, though. We can see level two, there may be alternate futures, and, and we are often going with a risk-based policy. A level three, which is, you know, we assume and we work off the, the assumption that the future is limited and bounded, and so we have a robust policy, but it's still static. So we identify plausible things that could happen and find a policy that works acceptably across most of them. And to be honest, between level, th level three is, is really where most foresight practice can, can end up. 
But if we wanted to really tackle being adaptive, being anticipatory, then understanding that the future is unlimited, it's unbounded, anything can actually happen, then we want to adapt we want to we want to embrace adaptive policy. So adapting the policy over time as conditions change and learning takes place. And this is really, really hard to do because often we don't get a, we don't get time to reflect and learn. We're often reacting and firefighting very quickly. So things to consider as, as you look to start to embrace elements of foresight systems or being anticipatory into your practice. Um, and here is just some five points that, that I've put down that, that have been based on, on, on my learnings to date. Being really clear about what is the ultimate objective you want to achieve, how big or narrow that objective is, will determine the types of approaches to use. What time horizon is going to be most appropriate for you? Is it, um, you know, are you still going to be comfortable at three years? Can you push out to five years? Can you push out to 15, 20 years? And being realistic about that, our ability to embrace the unknown can really um, impact how we make decisions. Very importantly, what is the risk appetite for change? Even if we produce the most amazing horizon scanning reports, if we produce you know, very, very robust types of scenarios, what is our risk appetite to invest differently, to invest into experimenting differently, to be prepared for those types of scenarios? How might that those types of interventions have to link to other processes, i.e. your procurement processes, your budgeting processes, your HR? And how, what are your current decision-making structures and how can insights about the future actually feed into those so that you're not creating anything new, but rather you're adapting what you have currently to be more anticipatory. Very quickly here, I just wanted to put a quick slide to show how we as UNDP Asia Pacific are embedding it through an institutionalization lens. A, we are working to embed it as part of our strategy and planning. We produce research and knowledge products um, to, to understand different types of change. We've, we're building an internal horizon scanning and capability building model so that we can understand future risks and feed that into our decision making. And fourth, we're trying to build the culture. So we're building networks, um, training the community, ensuring that our staff um, and our people are connected internally and externally to, to networks of people that think very much about the future and, and that changes that are impacting on all of us. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, it's been my pleasure and privilege to share this very short uh, presentation with you. Um, and I'm looking forward to questions later on. Thank you so much, Enrico, and I'll hand back to you. Fantastic, Karati, and, uh, and, and thanks a lot for this, you know, the clarity of thought that you have, you know, just beyond midnight at your end in New York, it's impressive. <laughs> I mean, we just need to say that Karati has uh, uh, gently accorded his session uh, in the night in, in, in that time zone. So, but thanks a lot. It's been a lot, a uh, lot to, lot to convey, uh, intense and, uh, and deep. Definitely some elements of, you know, the capabilities of all of us to, you know, stop for a moment and trying to, to see and sense what are the emerging claims that the future is sending us. I think it's it's uh, it's very key when, especially, we are distracted in everyday work, in the workload of things to do and things that just happen. So, but we will go more on this. Let me let me pass then to uh, Mr. Late. Uh, uh, Late, you have the floor. It would be fantastic to hear your experience. Uh, in, uh, as a colleague of many of your colleagues here in Maldives. So your, your, your testimony is very relevant to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, um, Enrico. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, honorable minister and, and the other uh, participants, including the UNDP participants who are here today. Um, Thank you so much for this opportunity, especially to, to be able to share some of the experience uh, from a small island states, uh, uh, which is uh, in the Pacific, um, 
a kind of similar uh, environment uh, such as the Maldives. Uh, before I um, uh, continue with um, sharing some of the experience, I thought to uh, give a bit of a background in terms of uh, uh, information about Vanuatu and especially those who haven't had the opportunity uh, to, to be able to uh, understand or read about the country itself. Um, uh, the country Vanuatu is actually a small country, uh, just about uh, 12,000 um, kilometers square of land. Uh, it's located in South Pacific, uh, close to Fiji, uh, between Fiji and uh, New Caledonia. It's comprised of 83 islands and has a population of around uh, just above uh, 300,000 uh, people. Uh, the nation it's, uh, itself is uh, strongly linked with the uh, cultural uh, and the custom, uh, which are send central to its uh, nation building and, and the future. Um, it has uh, large unusable land uh, with uh, high potential for uh, both uh, green and blue economies. And, and uh, we do have a, a aspiration, uh, which is enshrined in the uh, constitution, of course, also uh, in our national sustainable development plan. Uh, and uh, an a vision of uh, safe and secure and uh, prosperous uh, uh, Vanuatu. Um, but uh, having said that, uh, of course, we are challenged by uh, natural disaster, so, uh, which uh, we are frequently experiencing in this country. Uh, we are actually uh, ranked as uh, highly in terms of uh, the index uh, of vulnerability to uh, disaster. Uh, we have cyclones, uh, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and of course, um, We also have a very narrow tax uh, taxation base, uh, which then means uh, we cannot afford complete systems and, uh, of course, waste of uh, resources. Um, in addition to that, uh, we do have uh, very low human resource capacity that exists in the country, and that is one thing that we do struggle with, uh, and is a challenge for this country, especially with, in terms of. Uh, uh, policy making. Uh, <clears throat> going further in terms of how we approach uh, from the Ministry of Internal Affairs uh, point of view, um, our focus or our, our aspiration is to be uh, future fit, uh, as uh, we always say. And, and to be future fit, uh, it requires us to be uh, collectively intelligent, which means it, it requires uh, uh, us to pull in intelligence across uh, the different players, of course, to be able to benefit from them. Um, <clears throat> and of also um, as much as possible to be simple uh, uh, and adaptable design and, and based on the available resources, skills and the experience we have. Um, so we've come down to what we call uh, a local language, we call it the Nasara concept, whereby, um, you know, we, we meet uh, where we, we see it uh, as a collaborative habit, where it is safe uh, to meet and have discussions and agreement. Uh, this is a concept that uh, has been adopted previously by uh, the traditional uh, leaders or chiefs of this country, where uh, they sit around the Nasara and, and have uh, heated discussions. Of course, uh, at the end of the day, they resolve yeah, issues. So our approach is using that approach uh, given uh, that is the traditional approach that we have and, and, and design our strategic plan uh, to fit uh, in terms of, uh, to fit, future fit uh, in terms of anticipatory and, and being a uh, risk informed. Uh, part of that also um, is not just being able to sit and, and discuss and uh, come to agreement, but also to have uh, consultations uh, beyond just with, beyond the Ministry of Internal Affairs alone. Uh, which includes other development partners, private sectors, and of course, uh, uh, the non-government organizations, which are, which are a key player in terms of uh, you know, what we do, especially being the Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs. So, so our experience uh, um, has been that uh, you know, previously, we've, our discussion has been focused on the immediate risks, uh, evolving threats, and potential uh, crises. As, as uh, 
been the traditional approach of how we do things here. And what we've seen is uh, we've resu it resulted in us just navigating to crisis and responding to approaches, not looking beyond or thinking beyond, uh, or anticipating uh, what, what the future will be like. Um, with now, uh, the anticipatory approach, uh, we want to predict the future uh, uh, and how it will look like and take ad, uh, the advantage of the tools available and set the cost for our development uh, strategy. One of the greatest, uh, as I said, one of the greatest cultural history that we have is, is uh, I do want to acknowledge is the great chief called uh, Roy Mata who sets the example of uh, bringing tribes together uh, gather in what we term as, uh, we call as Nasara in the local language, uh, where uh, they sit and discuss and predict the future uh, and what needs to be done uh, by each people. And, and this example of uh, anticipatory um, planning uh, and discussions, um, noting what the risk would be, uh, has been really helpful in terms of uh, us guiding us in having a ministry uh, strategy. Whilst we know uh, the future will be different uh, to present, we, we, we do acknowledge that we, we struggle with imagining uh, that there is uh, you know, no one future that uh, our actions today will actually help share or um, create different options. Now, one of the things that to also acknowledge as previously mentioned by the speakers is uh, climate change as, as a major impact on uh, our lives, uh, it shapes our daily, daily lives, uh, given the, uh, the island nature of, uh, of our uh, country, especially with the 83 islands. Uh, so this, with that, uh, we do have uh, uh, category cyclone, category five cyclones, which are now increasing phenomena, phenomena uh, and, and, and a threat to, to us. Uh, and this is uh, a, a, an issue of uh, uh, major importance for us, especially in terms of uh, um, anticipating you know, what, what would be the future will be like. Uh, we've also got the environmental uh, threats uh, that uh, are not only to Vanuatu's concern, but uh, of course, the rapidly changing uh, geopolitical context in the Pacific, as uh, many of you might read, uh, have read. Uh, you know, we do have the COVID as the pandemic uh, the ICT and the business uh, technologies, which, uh, which are continuing to be a challenge to our national security. Um, we have, uh, while acknowledging that we do have a, a very uh, low capacity or skill capacity, we do also have a brain drain through seasonal workers in Australia, uh, New Zealand, and uh, perhaps uh, US uh, in the future. And this is going to create uh, skill gaps, uh, which is a key policy uh, issue for us. Uh, having said that, um, <clears throat> one of the things that this ministry is, uh, uh, has a charter uh, for it uh, as, as this ministry is uh, decentralization, which is uh, perhaps one of the most powerful policy imperative that uh, uh, we feel that is currently shaping uh, one of this future. And, and uh, over the past years, uh, our focus has been really trying to attract people back to uh, the six provinces, uh, but uh, as we see today, that uh, today many companies, investors, NGOs, and even what to uh, local entrepreneurs are actually moving into provinces to establish this, uh, their presence. Uh, this is actually a good thing in terms of uh, uh, you know what what we are promoting uh, and and what we are seeing in terms of public servants, especially uh, traditionally wanting to you know move back to the uh, and, and have their retirement at the uh, villages uh, with their retirement packages. And of course, the skills, uh, the technology that they bring across. Um, but what, what that means is that uh, with the direction, it does, um, it does uh, uh, put a strain in terms of the customary and cultural uh, networks or systems that are in already in place and that uh, for us we, we do need to acknowledge that and the nasara concept that again uh, we have continually to promote uh, we feel that that's that's really a, 
collaborative investment approach that uh, brings on uh, uh, collective approach to it, but at the same time also uh, mindful of the uh, the risk and opportunities that uh, you know are ahead of it. Uh, <clears throat> I do also want to say that uh, with that we also have a change in in the direction in Evendry. Uh, people are now returning to rural areas. Um, to focus on what we call a green goal, which is the land, which is land in particular, uh, and increasing production in rural areas. Uh, and interestingly, we do have a declining uh, birth rate uh, in, in, in the uh, rural areas. And this is against, uh, you know, regional trends that, uh, so we're, we're seeing that the uh, um, future of Vanuatu is uh, really uh, moving from rather than uh, into urban, but it's uh, more or less people are moving back to uh, provincial or rural areas. Uh, and this for us uh, is, is a great uh, challenge uh, in terms of providing the essential service uh, such as health and uh, education. So lo looking into the future, as I said, uh, how our focus or our uh, theme or our mandate that uh, we continue to preach and of course uh, our director general has continued to be calling for is, is for us to be future fit. Uh, while, while empowering that we know this is, uh, uh, this is empowering for us, but at the same time, it's also uh, threatening because uh, we've, you know, uh, non even what to uh, can, can assume and uh, you know, predict what the country will look like uh, in, in the next 30 years uh, that has been, but with, uh, anticipatory planning, we do see that, uh, you know, with the trends that are happening and the risks that are high, we see that there's a, there's a much more of a, a predictable uh, opportunity that we can take, uh, <clears throat> take charge of. So our experience with the um, anticipatory governance, um, for us, it's is, is been really led by our understanding of our needs and objectives. Um, it is also informed by our capacity. As I said, uh, we do have a very low capacity, uh, scale capacity, but whatever is available, we do want to, uh, <clears throat> as much as possible, we do want to capitalize on it. Uh, the other thing we've, we've also uh, taken is really our approach has uh, been really wanting to be practical. Uh, we, st we started with acknowledging the limited resource that we have um, and not, uh, and we cannot afford uh, very, highly expensive approaches. Uh, so rather we find ways of uh, global, uh, to, to be able to bring global and local intelligence into the ministry and, and be able to work on things. Uh, so for us, uh, our team is looking at uh, how we can ramp up the interactions. One of the key areas that we see as, as, a, as an opportunity is also to look into uh, our interactions with the youth. So the youth uh, percentage of population in this country is, is around uh, 51%, and that is for the 18 years old. Um, <clears throat> and, and we do need to be really mindful of uh, the security issues that uh, the youth are bringing. And, and so this is one thing that we are seeing as a trend that is currently uh, um, displaying for us. Uh, in, in terms of uh, how we want to uh, deliver our, on our future feed promises, as I said, uh, we do. We have a strategy. Uh, now that's been drafted uh, uh, and reflected on, uh, basically, on the past to inform the future. Um, in the next few weeks, uh, <clears throat> we basically what we have done is we have identified objectives or activities where where we can usefully dedicate it. Uh, our, our have dedicated resources, uh, research into it. And, and, and start to look at some of them in, in much more deeper to understand it. Uh, so for me, one of the things I'm really, really excited to research on is uh, really the role of private sector in assisting uh, government in uh, uh, decentralization. Uh, so what else we have done? Of course, uh, yes, we, we have, we've been really looking at our policy and activities to ensure they are risk informed. Uh, we are accepting complexity of the risk and uh, appreciating its interaction with uncertainties that we may best, uh, we may have based on our data. A step we plan to do is uh, uh, to have biannual horizon scanning within our ministry, which will allow that space for us to 
they expect especially to, to, to look at and pay attention to some of the issues that are uh, popping up and, and to be able to devise the uh, way forward uh, as part of the horizon scan. So it, uh, to, to, yes, in, to conclude, I think, um, yes, in, in a short summary, yes, the, our experience with the uh, anticipatory governance as uh, planning has really showed us the following. Um, and that is thinking about the future uh, to us is natural because of the long standing uh, traditional history of uh, finding community based mitigation strategy uh, to prepare for uh, the unknown uh, climate, political, and tectonic events. Um, we feel that you know this proud history tradition of consultation and uh, collaboration uh, for common goods uh, uh, needs to be strengthened uh, and by utilizing emerging foresight and anticipatory uh, strategies and uh, factoring risk we we are aware of and uh, we're developing tools to regularly scan the emerging trends that are uh, happening around um, this country uh, let let me finish up to say uh, we must uh, take charge of visualizing and planning for our present by looking into our past in order to take charge uh, of our future. And, and thank you so much again for the opportunity. Uh, I'm definitely willing to, to share you know, this presentation uh, over uh, email with the organizers. Thank you. Hey, this has been wonderful. And um, you know, coming from, uh, from a colleague of the many here, we have, uh, I'm counting 280 plus colleagues around coming from the experience of Banuata. This is, this has been very rich and again, very packed with a lot of uh, commitment efforts that everybody is putting uh, into, into trying to do this at the best of the capabilities of a system that is the Vanuatu this institution and, and people around. I, I picked, you know, I was struck by a couple of concept of the many that I could pick and it's very difficult to, to choose one, but the, uh, the Nashara, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful proposition, right? It's where you create that safe space of reflection into the present. You took it out from the, the daily workload and everything. And, and you mentioned something very important to all of us is on how that space becomes inclusive and it can benefit from collective intel intelligence of what is emerging and what are the sense and you mentioned the youth you mentioned the private sectors so at the end it's, it's not about you know uh guessing what is going to happen it's about what capabilities are we going to build within us in order to be able to respond to to a possible scenario because this has been fantastic thanks a lot i I just have a couple of questions. I really want the team and the participant to, to be able to ask questions as well. So I just have very a short uh, ping pong with each of you. Um, Arati, I'll start with you. You know, at times we could be intimidated by you know the foresight concept. It seems abstract at times to, to people who have not experienced it. And there are multiple tools and methods from horizon scanning scenarios you mentioned. There are several levels of futures that we that you explained to us. So it, it may sound intimidating at times, uh, but if you had to run up to some concrete thing that governments right, can do as a starting point, what that would be and how would it feel like? Great, thanks Enrico. And it's a really, really fantastic question. So I come back to the point of being clear about what the objective is. There are some very easy entry points uh, that, that we can start with. So um, you might start with doing very light touch horizon scanning. So that is essentially trying to bring a team together to do a scanning of trends and things that are emerging that is likely to impact on the Maldives uh, in the next, you know, you could say five years or 10 years. And you can do this once every three months, once every, you know, six months, depending on how often. It, it can be as big as you want, it can be as small as you want, right? So it's one of those things that I often say is, if you wanted to get started on anything, get started on 
get started with that. The second thing you could also do is, um, you know, if what you wanted to do wasn't just about bringing, you know, understanding risks or understanding what trends, but you actually wanted to do, let's say, collective visioning. What, what do, what does civil society, what do your citizens think about the future of Maldives? What, what is it, um, you know, is there, is there a participatory inclusive process you can, you can undertake? And that's quite a, that's quite an exciting, um, doesn't have to be increased, you know, it doesn't have to be incredibly complicated, but doing sort of that collective visioning process with citizens, with young people about the types of future that they would like to see can also be the start of a conversation around new types of policies. Uh, the third thing that I would also suggest is sometimes just research can be good. One of the things that they are practicing in, in Vanuatu, um, and what we are doing here at UNDP as well, is, you know, trying to understand a topic a little bit better. So we're doing these things called foresight briefs. So if you think about like what a traditional policy brief is, so not to not to not a massive research paper, um, you know, like 10,000 words, what you're looking at is to just do some desk based research to understand a new area or a new type of uh, emerging opportunity or a new tipping point. And you can just start with that and you can feed that into your policy dialogues, into your decision-making dialogue. So um, three different ideas there, uh, participatory visioning for getting citizens' inputs into, into a topic, some desk-based research, um, or if you really want to start to cultivate the muscle and intelligence, putting in a light touch horizon scanning, you know, you could have a team of five to get to get that started with, and it doesn't have to be hard at all. Um, but yeah, those are some really um, easy entry points to begin with. Thank you, Enrico. Thank you, Arati. And uh, I took note. <laughs> I'm sure colleagues have done that as well. Uh, Leif, let me come to you. You know, governments, bureaucracy, right, rely on rationality, predictability, at times, reality. Uh, so it's, and, and, you know, at times, structural incentives are not always aligned uh, with these kind of principles. So on top of it, we have capacity constraints, we have workload and all this. So can you just uh, tell us what could be an idea for infuse this kind of methodology and thinking into garment and what in your experience has worked and what has not worked? And we need also to be frank about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... Yes, I think that's that's a great question in terms of you know the practicality of making this work, um, especially working in the, in the government as you said you know you're bombarded every day with you know different directions instructions and so forth, um, and and given the nature of the government here it's it's also small, uh, of course uh, you know you, you we get instructions as well to do certain things, uh, but I think I think you know one of the things that we we do very well here with, with what we have done is really to, to just look at uh, individuals uh, and, and within you know, the court of people that you have, uh, whom you could just uh, focus on them and identify them that uh, these, are, these are key reformers. Uh, these are key people that were uh, the change or the drivers that I, we could start to solicit the idea with and then eventually you know, take this forward. And, and that for us, uh, it has been a really good uh, approach where within this ministry, we're able to, myself and a couple of more uh, uh, people, we're able to uh, select those people who are really keen to drive things and make a change and make a difference. And, and from there, uh, start to solicit the idea. And then eventually by doing that, uh, through this model, then we influence others who are around us to be able to come and, and accept uh, the concept and, and and then gradually this is now being talked within the ministry. Uh, and so uh, from there, then we, we start to sell it more broader. Uh, and and by, by bringing uh, you know, UNDP across with all the expertise as well, it starts to, um, uh, it starts to spread across further. And, and I think that in itself uh, comes to um, help in terms of you know, uh, fighting the everyday you know, pressures that we go through. Um, but at the same time, also, we, we take out some of these uh, people and, and focus on them and allow them time to, you know, really think and, and discuss issues and, and start to, uh, you know, identify uh, 
areas that are or issues that are popping up and what could be you know the future would look like uh, so that's that's been really good and then uh, with the support of our, our those we have here especially the UNDP team and of course uh, you know at the, at the colleagues who are reform minded thank you late and you know one of the responsibility of uh, leadership right it's making sure and enable an environment which is open and creates the space of uh, of the input and uh, you know i'm sure if we ask uh, you know the 277 participants here today who would like to contribute to that we would have an inflow of uh, wonderful insight uh, on the emergence of the future and so how to moderate that is going to be an intense and, and, and fascinating um, space of creation for an innovation so colleagues I, I i think this is part where i'm now handing the floor to 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 you all I, I will require some probably logistical help in to see who's raising the hand first. And I hope I won't miss anybody into this. We have, uh, of course, time is constrained, but we will try to pick up some of the questions. So I would suggest that you raise your hand and at one point maybe my colleagues or I would be able to, to locate you in my screen. I have 12 pages of screen, so I hope I can find your hands up. So by all means, and uh, please, and then of course, I'll give the floor. You can introduce yourself and pose the question and either Arati and Late will, will respond as they see most fit. So please, any hands up? The floor is open for questions. If any participant has any questions, you may switch on your microphones or just write in the chat box. Chat, chat box also good. I'm happy to read them for you if you have connection problems. All right, let me do a bit of sound on the pages. A couple of minutes for you to type. Very good. I have a, 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 a volunteer from Tartal Council. It's fantastic. Uh, Sarah Rifadam, please, by all means, uh, you can, you have the floor. You can unmute yourself. Uh, please. Thank you. Hi, you hear me? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for arranging such a uh, wonderful webinar. And uh, my question is regarding this uh, recital and what's the difference between strategic planning and uh, this foresight? It is a very good question. Uh, shall we wait for another one? I'm sure this Arati I saw from some body language. She wanted to, 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 to give an answer to this. I'm sure Do we have another question. So here the question, what's the difference between strategic planning and, uh, and foresight? Let's see if we have another volunteer. Thanks a lot for, for that. Appreciate. This is your space. This is a, you know, one of those moments in which, you know, even something that we haven't probably completely grasped, uh, we can ask, we can put. Fantastic. I have uh, Miss Maria Mohammed, I think. Yes, please, from MN. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'd like to say this is a wonderful webinar. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll have a question. Uh, you mentioned about that not being ready during the COVID situation, but we know that it was going to, it was predicted it's going to happen. What are the measures to prevent it in the future? I mean, what can government do to prevent it in the future? This is a, a gap we had. So what could we do in the future? Yes, and, and it's, it's very pertinent, you know. And this one, I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll ask late uh, to to give some some thoughts. So let's 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 do this first round of answers. Arati, you had the first question. Of course, it's free it's free talk. So and then late. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you so much, Enrico. And thank you, Arif. Uh, so strategic planning and foresight actually go very closely hand in hand. Huh? So planning often assumes you start from this, from a point of X, and you plan forward in a short time frame, usually three to five years, um, or you know, even sometimes we even do one year. Um, and you sort of plan in a very straight line. You assume that things are going to unfold like that. Um, the What foresight does when combined with strategic planning is it helps your planning become more anticipatory. So even when you're trying to think about what you're going to do for your work plan for the year, for example, how do we, if you have a very robust trends and futures analysis at the start of it, your planning can start to encompass new things that might be on the horizon. So whether that's new risks, new opportunities, new innovations you want to experiment in, um, that's what your planning can do. The other thing where foresight can really complement planning is when you're doing your review period. So very often when we review, we're just reviewing based on what has happened to date, and then we just keep doing the same thing over and over again. But if we can combine a more futures-oriented mindset, then uh, in a futures-oriented approach, then our the the periods in which we actually review um, can become a lot more quicker can be a little bit more forward looking. So what you're doing in your review period is saying, not just have we ticked all the boxes and done everything, but actually the questions you're asking is, what is emerging that may throw all our plans off track? What is emerging that might take us by surprise? And you start to be a little bit more um, aligned with that. So just to say that, um, Foresight goes very closely with good planning processes. Um, and actually, you can't do one um, without the other. Um, I'll stop there, Enrico, and, and back to you. Yes, we have the late. And then I understand also um, one of the ministers would like to contribute. We have a lot to learn as well. So, late, please, over to you on the second question, which was posed uh, by our colleague. Uh, Enrico, can you just repeat the question? Right, so uh, the question was on COVID, right? And the situation of that has happened with that. We, we, we knew at some point somewhere somebody had predicted and somehow there was uh, a claim. And I think, you know, globally, we were a bit surprised why the entire system did not, did not listen to those insights on emergence from the future. So the question was, wh what are we learn from that? What will we do for the, time, for the next time? You know, I know, for example, in your case, you, uh, Vanuatu has been hit as quite recently from uh, another surge of, of COVID. So what would be the thing that you, you in Vanuatu you would do looking into the next crisis? Yes, I, I think the, um, I think there was a, there was a good point raised by uh, Arita in terms of uh, um, not, not um, forgetting, you know, uh, that there's a, you know the signals that are coming up, and and that that is a very good point. That uh, you know we, we do know about this, we 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 are aware of it, but we think you know it's it's not important uh, for us to really focus on it. And and that's the same thing that we have gone through here as well in Vanuatu. That mm -hmm. for the last two years we haven't had COVID, and it's only uh, until this uh, fifth of this year we've had community outbreak. But we knew this was coming, uh, but we, we kind of sit back. And I think, you know, th this is a lesson learned from COVID, but also in terms of looking forward, uh, uh, this is an approach that we, we need to st start to think about, you know, more in terms of uh, anticipatory yes, planning. Thank you, Leith. You know, I'm just back from um, my... Um my own uh, continent, right? I was in Europe just a couple of weeks ago and you know how many signals we were given that something would have happened on the east of Europe with Ukraine and the crisis which, you know, And you know, at times is the willingness to, to listen, willingness to look ourselves into the mirror and try to see where the problem would emerge. It was not difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, Minister, I, I would really appreciate um, your thought on this. You are, you are one of those leads that live constantly into future thinking. 
So I very much appreciate your input on this. Well, thank you, Enrico. I, I quite like uh, Arti's presentation. This is very un-UNDP. I often would hear things that are very predictable, you know, like that in classical physics. You know, you don't like to get into the quantum world. Uh, um, look, uh, you know, with some of the participants talking about, you know, how do we avoid and, you know, uh, you know, these future uh, uh, doomsday events and how do we prepare ourselves for that? I don't think anybody can be really prepared. It's just like, uh, you know, we are all certain that one day we will become sick. You know, we will get, uh, we will get a flu, we will get something else. But what do we do? The best thing we can do is just tr stop, try to stay healthy. You, tr you, you stay healthy, you avoid certain things. Um, what is really required, so if I translate that to a, to a nation, you know, sort of a, you know, scenario, that would be, you know, you have, uh, the, the, you know, there's good governance in the country. Okay. Uh, <laughs> colleague, please mute your mic. Yes. When you talk to yes, minister, sorry, yeah, apologies. Yes. Uh, yeah, good leadership is 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 very 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 important, and leadership sometimes require leadership means that you make decisions, and if you are a good leader, you will make good decisions. If you are a bad leader, obviously most of your decisions will be wrong decisions. And how do you make good decisions? And it's by you know through a consultative process within limits within limits obviously you cannot make everybody take part in everything so you have to make that judgment yourself now when we when we tackled covid in in maldives i i would say i will claim this very proudly that maldives is one of those countries who who managed covid very 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 well uh, um, we we decided on a few things there were certain things we decided one, we decided we're not going to stop uh, the, uh, you know, the government's development program. We've not, got, okay, we will postpone some of the things, but we will go ahead. We're not going to come to a complete halt. We, we're going to keep walking. Okay, uh, it's just like, you know, you're not going to do a marathon now. You're going to do a, a slow run, but you will not stop. Don't come to a, a complete halt. Let's just let's just wait for the the right moment where we can start, you know, coming back to the the, the normalcy and then you know start doing things. And and and, and we we made that that is one of the decisions we made. And then quick and and then we went on changing, you know, as things changed, you you kept you kept we kept on changing our, our decisions. Okay, it's this is the time to reopen our borders. This is the time for us to, you know, uh, uh, you know, ease on that particular thing, ease on that. I can see certain countries who went on. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, I am. It would have been very, very wrong decision for us if we decided that, uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID was a common, a common cold, a flu-like thing. Because there are a lot of talks, you know, in, in, in uh, among leaderships of many countries. Let's just get on with this. It'll be a common code. That would have been a wrong decision. On the other extreme, if we wanted to go for zero COVID, you know, like certain countries, that would be a wrong decision for us. So we'll have to find a balance. And that balance will depend on, you know, which, which country you are from. And that this, this requires leadership. Strong leadership. You have to listen to people, but you have to make your own decisions. I believe we did that, and that's what it is. And the future is never certain. The only, the only certainty we have is yesterday, is the past, is what happened. And today, we only make, you know, the, 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 the past. Today, we make it a reality. Uh, so some predictions, and some things in, 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 in you know, in, in, in life are certain, some are not. You know, there are cyclic patterns that will come. For those uncertain things, we just have to be, uh, you know, we just have to be healthy, prepared to have a good economy. Uh, uh, you know, have you know, you know, a decent level of reserve in your, uh, uh, you know, savings. 
Um, and then you have the infrastructure. Uh, when, if something happens, that you know things will move. I think that's the best we can do. We can never be prepared for a doomsday scenario. It would be foolish for us to like you know uh, start you know having bunkers and you know saving food for a day where things. You know, climate change is definitely going to happen. We're going to live here. So what we have decided in terms of climate change, the we will the decision we have made is more Indians are going to stay on these islands for many 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 generations to come. We're not going to leave. That's the that's the decision we made. Of course, to live here, the future will be challenging, and we've accepted that it will be, it will be, it will be a challenging future. Now, obviously, those challenges will be, you know, different sorts of things. We will tackle them. Some of them we will tackle as it comes. Some we will prepare ourselves for that. So there is no clear, or, or, you know, answer to how do we avoid this. There is no way to avoid it. You can only manage it. Uh, Enrico, thank you so much. That's just my thoughts. Uh, Minister, uh, first of all, um, I'll accept the challenge on, on UNDP and see if I can still surprise you every now and then with some thoughts which are not uh, in the in the classic uh, classic thinking on development. There's a lot that we could share, and, and I'm happy with that. But you you mentioning you know the, the first of all the you know the way Maldives has been able to to manage the crisis of COVID has been exemplary and it's something that. In fact, to a certain extent, uh, it would require uh, from all of us also an effort to document it and share it with, uh, with, uh, with other countries. There's a lot. So this is where the, the reflection on experiences is important to be shared. And um, you're perfectly right. Is the, you know, we can never be certain, but how do you manage with strong leadership and, uh, um, and openness to listen on the, on the wider knowledge and intelligence which is around you? In those transitions, it's where there is a stress test for good governance, good leadership, and things. And if you manage the transitions well, then uh, you teach me how the surfing is going to be much, much easier. So I really appreciate that, uh, Minister. There's definitely a lot we could talk more on this. I wanted to pick up a, um, a question from the floor, which is coming on the chat. Um, I see, and I'll just read it as is from. MH, and so I, apologies, I will not be able to spell the entire name, but I see what are the possible adaptation strategy by executives and stakeholders to use planning with the consideration of foresight? Who would like to, Arati, would you go with that? Sure, I'm happy to take that, Enrico. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister. So I think there's sort of three things I would suggest there. A, before you start your planning process, do a, you can start with doing a much more futures informed analysis about what the changing landscape is going to be. Usually when you start a strategic planning process, you're asking, the first question you're asking is where are we now and where do we want to go? So instead you might want to start with the question, what is already changing in the landscape in front of us? And how might that change where we are heading? Or, or, you know, is there a different direction we want to go to? The second thing, and what I think is the most important thing in any type of planning and foresight or policy making process, is more is doing a much more rigorous implications analysis. So if we think these are the types of changes that are going to occur over the next one, three, five, ten years, what are the implications for us as a nation, as a government, as civil society? And then sort of tread that through. You're almost wanting to wind it backwards to say, Okay, if this is the potential implication, then what does that, that mean for the type of planning we have to do now? Where must we invest differently? Where must we innovate differently to be prepared for that? Um, and then finally, I, the last part that, part that is something that often gets missed is how we evaluate and review a planning process. And I, and, I, and I touched on this earlier as well. A normal planning process, you know, you start from the start, you have your midpoint review, and then you have your end of year evaluation. But if we want to be adaptive, then those review processes have to occur a lot more frequently, and they don't have to be complicated. It could just feed into your leadership decision-making um, avenues that exist. And you're asking different 
different questions. You know, the types of questions you want to ask is, okay, this is the plan that we fed. This is how we're tracking. What is happening? What is emerging? Is this is this going to be a risk to us? Is this an opportunity for us? Do we need to, you know, set aside a little bit of investment to do some innovation to be better prepared? It's those review processes to understand how something that how a disruption is going to take your strategy off course and having doing that a lot more frequently often is, is helpful and it doesn't have to be a cumbersome process. Um, I'll stop there, uh, Enrico, just for some quick ideas to the minister and I'll, and I'll hand back to you. Very good, very good. And uh, I see also a question for Leigh, which I would like to read from, uh, uh, from a colleague. Uh, what is your your foresight and strategies for the increasing risk posed by climate change? You touched upon that during your presentation. Uh, would you spell maybe one or two uh, quick highlights on the strategy for that future that you are foreseeing with the climate emergency, in fact, uh, which is hitting everybody? Sorry, and Enrique, can you can you come again? I'm having sure, sure. No, no, no problem. No problem. Apologies for that. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I asked this question from the floor, which is coming to you. And it's about, you know, in relation to the climate change threat, right? Which everybody is very well, is not emergent, is it's very visible <laughs> to all of us. What are the foresight and strategies that uh, Vanuatu has put forward to manage that 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 process? You know, two highlights. I know it's it's a it's a White question, but it's important. Thank you. I think uh, <clears throat> yes, that that is um, yes. Um, I mean, if I may, I may say um, <clears throat> may admit here that I'm actually working in the um, Ministry of Internal Affairs, and and the climate change strategies, of course, uh, they are actually outside. Of, right. Uh, my yes, the focus of what what we do, uh, but. Yeah, there's been there's been a lot of work um, that's been that's been done here uh, in terms of the strategies. Um, I can't really, to be honest, I can't really think uh, specifically in terms of the details of what what's been done uh, in terms of the uh, foresight. Uh, but the work that we've been doing, pretty much uh, in terms of anticipatory planning, is, is really been within the Ministry of Internal Affairs, uh, as and really going across to the other agency, but this is one thing that uh, once once we get the strength here, then we're able to, you know, uh, take it across to the other ministries as well. But yes, to be honest, I, I uh, yes, I cannot answer that question because uh, yes, it's really outside of, uh, you know, my focus of uh, experience and work. No problem, Leighton. And, and, you know, and this is exactly where the, the intersection of this conversation are important, right? So why, you know, planning or those horizontal ministries will look into, you know, collecting the uh, the information and the perceptions and the studies and the knowledge that's been built upon decades of exposure to the issues. As much as we understand the the, the concurrent, everything which is happening at the same time, the commitment that every uh, ministry will do, the, the collection and the space created for us to intersect the thinking across ministry is probably the one that I would imagine an horizontal uh, offer like the Minister of Planning will, uh, will facilitate across and how that also works in a special diversified environment like the one of multiple island countries. I think it's, uh, it's important. Um, I have one more question from the floor, which was posed and apologize I missed that in my things. It was vision versus value. So Arati, you mentioned about being very clear about the objectives. Vision and values are two anchors that all of us are using to keep that objective proper and in focus. So any reflection on that? Thank you. I mean, I think for me, the values that underpin, you know, there's two things. I think they're both equally important. We need a North Star. We need a North Star globally as, as citizens of the world, as citizens of the country, nation states we're a part of, but we need the North Star to give us hope about what it is we're working towards, particularly at times when things seem so complex and difficult right now, when that vision can really bring us forward to be hopeful about the future. I think that's, that's one of the most powerful things about robust foresight. 
But foresight can also be done really badly. You know, if we impose something done in one country down, you know, into another country and not adapt it, we just take a cookie cutter approach, that's that's foresight done badly. The values that we want to be inherent in the types of futures we want to create without just following blindly what what is happening in other parts of the world, I think will make the difference about the types of world our children and grandchildren will inherit. You know, one of the things I love about the Vanuatu experience is that they've grounded it very much in the values um, that, that already exist and having that grounded and having it in a very Vanuatu and vision of the future, I think makes it, makes it more, um, personal, makes it more intimate and becomes much more integral for everybody to sign up to. So to me, those two things go hand in hand, giving us the North Star for something we hope and want to work towards for our children and grandchildren and the types of values that we want to infuse into that future so that we're not just blindly adapting different practices without thinking about how our culture, how our how our inherent um, value systems will also be impacted. You know, it's it was something that um, I often think about in my work, which is, well, what kind of ancestors do we want to be if we think about the world we're living for our children and grandchildren? Um, I'll stop there. Well, I think thanks. And this analogy of the North Star, you know, um, is, is, is in fact very true. You know, I was, uh, and the 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 hope uh, is in fact for Maldives' agenda, right? And it's uh, and uh, I was yesterday uh, with the uh, you know it's actually the president launching the uh, gender action plan for the next five years, and that has given you know momentum of a collective effort to make sure that you know gender equality is uh, mainstream across everything we do everywhere in the countries. You know, if you don't have a North Star as a reference clear as that, then it's difficult to find a better one. But um, let me wrap it up, uh, colleagues. Um, you know, we said, the minister said it, and thanks a lot for, for gracing uh, us, uh, um, minister, today. The future is unpredictable, but it's not mean that we are powerless against it. The future can be anticipated, explored, uh, changed, uh, the future studies deals with all of that, right? This is what we do in foresight. And, uh, and people can engage thinking about the future to reduce uncertainty and prepare for what might happen. And it's not about changing that event too much that we can predict that it's gonna happen. It's about what will you do on yourself? What will you do on your organization? What will you do on that system of institution and people? and collective effort and passion to be able tomorrow to face any challenge. You know, Peter Drucker said the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I'm sure here amongst 240 people participating, there is a lot of creators and innovators that would like to change their future. So the, 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 the commitment is all on yours. For me, it has been a pleasure today. Um, I really would like to thank a couple of colleagues. Um, Arati, you stayed with us way past midnight, uh, but if this, this gave you a sense of accomplishment in the question that all colleagues have asked you and the interest and the rich conversation, I'm sure it was uh, an early night well spent. Leif, you've been fantastic. You've been traveling for to, <laughs> to participate to this meeting just to have a proper stream of conversation and uh, Wi-Fi. There's a lot of work on behind this, so thank you a lot for that experience. It's very much appreciated. I would like to thank also the UNDP multi-country office, Fiji, which has allowed this uh, to be input at with you, you know, to find a, a leaders of your sort uh, around the many that we deal across Asia Pacific and the world in 170 plus country. I think we just got the right person for today. Uh, Minister, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I'll, I'll take the challenge home on the surprising with the NDP new new uh, dialogues. Let's see how it goes. CSTI, you've let's... been fantastic. Sorry, yes, you Minister. Let me finish with your thanks and then I'll, I'll leave the, from the floor. CSTI, you've been a fantastic team. Thank you so much. President Office has been with us in the design of this. We had a conversation like this a uh, couple of, uh, weeks ago and we put this together. I'm very happy for that. If this webinar has left you the curiosity to do more and to learn more about this, then 
we would have achieved our objective. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Back to CSDI. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Arti and Mr. Leith. We definitely have got a lot of insightful thoughts from your expositions. And thank you, Enrico, for moderating the session so wonderfully. I would also like to thank uh, Minister Aslan. We are highly appreciative of your presence and your insightful contributions for today's webinar. Um, before we conclude, uh, we would like to take a group photo of all participants and speakers. So I request all our participants to switch on your video, uh, videos for the group photo. If our participants could please switch on your videos for the photograph. Oh, wonderful. I think we have got a few photographs. So thank you to all our participants for attending today's session. Um, we would like to, um, we'll be sharing a link with all of you in the chat box. So kindly register or complete your registration for this webinar. We will also be sharing um, a feedback form uh, via email once the session is over. So we would love to hear from you um, regarding your feedback. Also, um, speakers, uh, there are some questions that uh, we've received in the chat box. Shall we um, share your email addresses with the participants so that they can contact you? Is it okay? Okay, Ms. Arati. Yes, thank you, Ms. Lee, as well. Okay, um, so once again, thank you all for participating and for taking out your time to attend this webinar. We have a great lineup of events to come in the future. Um, so thank you once again to all our speakers and, and participants. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Participants, we will be sharing the registration link. So please submit your, uh, please fill up the Google form to complete your registrations. Um, participants, uh, please note that since uh, a lot of other participants have left, um, we will be emailing you the registration link. So kindly fill the link afterwards. Thank you. We have also shared um, the link in the chat box. So if you can fill it up, that would be great. Um, thank you.